In this video, I'm going to cover the topic of debugging. <clears throat> um, and hopefully by the time that we're done, uh, you all will have uh, enough familiarity with debugging to at least figure out how to do some basic strategizing on how to deal with debugging and errors in code. Um, definitely how to use print statements to debug code and also uh, a little familiarity with how to use the time module in Python. So debugging. Uh, debugging is a process of locating and removing errors. Um, and there are all kinds of different bugs. Um, there's the kind that cause your program to crash and not run. Uh, those are one kind of bugs. And then there's the kinds of bugs that give you the wrong answer. And these ones are the worst. They're insidious, they're dangerous, they're evil. Why? Because you don't even know they're happening. So uh, those are both of these kinds. We want to, um, obviously we always want our code to run, but we want to make sure our code is running appropriately and giving us the right answers. So it's really important that we consider both of these areas when we're, de when we're developing and writing code. How do we avoid bugs? Uh, well, uh, one of the ways that we do this is by designing code good overall. So well-designed code is going to be important. That's why it's important to think about the flow control. Think about the progress and the order of code and when things need to happen and whether or not changes that happen to variable need to belong to various conditional statements or various for loops or you know where they need to be tabbed, where they need to be tabbed out. Um, these are all really important components of writing good code. Another really, really important part of code is to make sure that you're validating your results. Um, so a lot of times, you know, I'll take a test sample and I will uh, actually calculate the, the, the correct value and then I'll run that subset of value, that subset of data through my code and make sure that I'm matching the result from my, my hand-generated results. Um, you can also validate by comparing results from this from your program to another program. Um, you can build redundancies in your program. And then another uh, really important part is, is allowing the creation of progress reports. Um, so, you know, are you processing the, right, processing the right number of files, the right number of rows? Getting your program to report back to you what is happening is one of the most important steps you can take in debugging. Um, but I'm gonna just be honest with you, it's frustrating. The process of writing code, as you've already realized, is not an easy process. There's so much that you don't know and there's so many things that could go wrong. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out what those are. So. As we realize that it's frustrating, we also have to realize that it's not in our best interests to get frustrated. So try to be calm, try to be patient, treat every problem as a challenge, if at all possible, not as a barrier. Um, it'll, it'll, that adjustment to your perspective can do um, wonders for your mental health as a programmer. Uh, so what are some strategies that we can take when debugging? If it's going to be such a frustrating experience, are there any ways we can approach it that might help us? Um, one, you can build up um, your upon working elements. So we've talked about this before. You know, I was showing you examples in class where I was copying pieces of code that I know work in other programs and pasting them into my program because I know that it works, right? I might have to manipulate certain parts of it, change a variable here, change a variable there, change the name of something here, change what it's referencing there, right? But take code that you already know works and build on it. You know, take code that you already know works and identify where in that code you need to change, right? If you know the flow control the of the code, where the, what the flow is through your program, you can identify where things need to change. So always start with things that you know. Um, take your problems and break them up into pieces. Don't try to do everything all at once. It's the worst way to approach it. Take it, break it up into pieces, identify the parts that you know how to fix first. It will help you out a lot. Then you can focus on the harder parts once you've done the parts that, you are, that are easier for you. And finally, set up a sandbox. Never run when you're writing code and generating a new algorithm uh, never run code on all of your data <coughs> and never run it on um, 
on your it never let it allow it to like do something to your actual real data you don't want it to um, have a bad effect and and do something that's going to be detrimental to your project as a whole so build a sandbox where you can play right build a spot that is sort of quarantined from the rest of your computer where you can go ahead and play around um, with everything uh, a big important part about strategies is, is if as the better you get at it you'll start thinking about your assumptions right think about the versions of the programs that you're running make sure that you save changes before you run your program that's a big one um, check to make sure that line endings aren't an issue right so if i import in a data file is it coming from a windows environment and i'm running on mac it might not read in correctly into python then um, Am I assuming that it's just a regular text file? Have I checked? Have I looked? Have I seen that it is? Check the contents of your data file. This is one of the most important ones. A lot of times people will start writing code before they really know what they're looking at or trying to do. You need to know where you're starting from to know where you're going to go. Uh, compare the results of your program to a subset of values that you know are right. So prepare a test data set understand what that test file looks like it doesn't have to be very long in fact you want it to be short because you want it you want this subset of data to encompass the kinds of problems that you write, might run into when you run a data file but to run very quickly so you can assess your program very quickly what about some specific techniques um, well isolating the problem is uh, is a really useful one so when you get an error look at that line that is indicated to be the error line and if you don't see an error there if it looks perfect look at the previous line or if, keep on going up right so a lot of times what will happen is you'll get an error and it's the previous line which is causing the error this is a common mistake with parentheses like not having the right number or close parentheses uh, brackets or what have you or uh, quotation marks uh, and then another thing that you can do to isolate the problem is you can use comments to remove code from the program. So if you're having a very problematic part, perhaps you can just turn off that part of the code and figure out if it's this part or if it's another part. Um, so you can, it's like a genetic knockout, right? We're knocking out pieces of the code to try to isolate with the part that's really functionally important. And then, um, a really, really important part about debugging is writing verbose programs. And what do I mean by verbose? It means that when you're writing code the first time through, you want to get lots of feedback and you want to use the print method a lot. You want it to output the values of expected of variables. And this will tell you whether or not you're going into an if statement or you're not, whether you're going into a for loop or you're not. Right? Are these values changing every loop of the for loop or aren't they? Why aren't they? Oh, I misspelled the val I misspelled the variable name here. So that's why it's not changing, right? Using those print methods are going to be so important to you in terms of getting feedback. If you don't use the print method to output uh, the values of lists or variables or other components of your program, you have no idea if what you think is happening is actually happening. Right. And this is where these insidious unseen uh, uh, bugs can really cause lots of lots of issues. Um, and the other thing that you can do is you can use comments to explain your code well. Right. A lot of times if you comment your code well and someone looks at it, they might look at your code and they'll look at your comment and they'll say, well, the, that, that's not actually what you're doing. That's not what you're trying to do. Right. So it's a not only informative for you, because sometimes you go if you write enough code, you'll go back and you might not remember what you were trying to accomplish. But it's also informative for someone who might be trying to help you debug. And then lastly, you can run debugging runs where basically you set it up so that the computer will be more verbose at certain times when you tell it to turn debugging on and will be less less uh, uh, verbose when you tell it to turn it off. And you can use it to test certain types of code in different instances. In addition to these other types of debugging, there are some more advanced approaches, uh, one of which, which I'll introduce, but we're not going to spend a lot of time in this class, is optimization. 
Um, and this is basically how uh, we think about this as being related to how fast your program's running. Um, this class is called Practical Computing for Scientists. In the end, I'm just caring that your, your stuff works, but we, were, we will run into some problems where our programs may take a long time to run, and it'd be nice if we could figure out ways to make them more elegant and have them run more quickly and operate better. Um, and to do that, you would use something referred to as the time package in Python. And a good way to do this is you can you know, identify a, a start time and an end time of your loop and see where your program is taking its time. Uh, a good example would be something like this. Say we have a dictionary and we wanted to add some items to our dictionary. We could use this sort of if else uh, structure, which is perfectly valid and works perfectly well to do this process, right? It's going to, if the name already exists in the dictionary, it's gonna add it to it. If the key does not exist in the dictionary, if there's, if the name is no, not in the dictionary, it's gonna create a new key, right? And that would work just fine. However, if we were to take an approach where we were to use, uh, instead of an if else structure, a try and accept structure, uh, we could speed up this process enormously. Um, and so uh, what happens is, is this process of try and accept can be up to 2000 times faster than using that if and else uh, structure. It, does, it just does a better job of, it, <coughs> of handling errors. Um, so those are some of our processes of having uh, how to debug our code. Um, but what happens if you're still stuck? Like you can't make any progress, right? Well, guess what? You've got friends, you've got peers, you've got um, people you can ask. Get a friend, sit with them, someone else who knows your code, and then explain to them line by line what you're trying to do, right? Someone who's familiar with what you're trying to do and explain it to them and see if they agree, right? And they may say like, no, you forgot to do this or that's not gonna work because of this. But that's one of the ways you can get feedback from people. Um, the internet is your friend, um, but it's not your close friend necessarily. It's kind of like an acquaintance you know a little bit and maybe uh, you met a couple times at a party. Uh, you kind of know their first name, but you can't really be sure if you remember it. And they give you some information, but you're not sure if it's related exactly to what you're doing. So it can be incredibly useful, right? There is so much information out there and you should leverage that information as a programmer. However, you need to understand that not everything that you run into in the internet is actually gonna be helpful for you. Um, so, you know, Google is your friend, online forums like Stack Exchange. Um, there's a, a other series of other things that we could use to, to look for help with programming. Uh, I encourage you to use all of them. I will say that there, uh, you do have to be, have a little bit of a strong stomach to use some of these online environments because people aren't necessarily all that kind because guess what? They're busy people and they're, they're kind of giving their time of their goodwill and addressing your coding problems. So if you come in there and you're not courteous or um, you don't provide context to your problem or you haven't done due diligence already and searched for answers and you're asking them something that is very simple and that would be easily findable if they had searched for it themselves on the internet, then they're going to probably give you a, a little bit of grief, right? Um, so it's important that, you know, you, you engage honestly with other people. Don't rely on other people to do your work for, for you, but the internet is obviously a great source of information for you. If you are going to engage with them, make sure you give people enough information. I've often asked you this. You guys will sometimes send me emails and say, I, I'm having this problem. Like, well, I need more information. I need to see the code. I need to see the error output. I need to see what is going on. So in these cases, if you really want to engage appropriately, you'll provide data files, system configurations, whatever specific error message you're getting or issue with the code that you're having. But make sure that you give enough information to the people you're in interacting with that they can actually recreate the problem that you're having. Uh, so these are some of the things that you can do. Um, I encourage you all to take ownership of your debugging process. Uh, and I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of, of how um, this actually plays out when we look at code. So let's first just think of some common mistakes that can happen when we debug. So say we've just got two variables, um, sex and age, and we want to output some information. So say we're going to print mail and, you know, I happen to forget 
a parentheses, right? And I'm gonna print age. Notice that when I run this, it says that there's something wrong on the print age line. And in fact, you'd look at that and you would say, no, there's nothing wrong with this line. Why is there anything wrong with this line? What's wrong with this line is you never really effectively ended the line before it. So it's very important in this case that you actually fix um, this. And, oh, it's not defined. It's the wrong variable, right? There we go. Now we can print sex, uh, print age. We've got our the right variable identified. We've got the right uh, parenthesis in place. Um, these all matter. Again, you know, if we leave um, a, a, a quotation open, right? It's going to say, "Hey, the end of the line didn't it didn't find the end of the line." You know, these are the kinds of mistakes that we might find. Um, I do want to identify that there's something called, uh, there are ways for us to set up uh, a debugging mode. And so one of the ways to do this is we can use the sys module um, and we can create a, a variable, which is a Boolean variable, which we really haven't used much so far in the class. But Boolean variables are variables that are either going to be true or false. So if I say debug is true, right, what's going to happen is if I have this debugging statement, Anything that I put under an if debug statement will activate. So in this case, I can um, say, hey, if debugging is on, I want it to tell me, right? So here, debugging is true. So if I run this command, if debug, it's going to evaluate whether de debug is true or false. If it is, it's going to print that statement. If it's false, right? It's not going to output anything. Um, so debugging will be turned off. So you could put all kinds of statement under your debug. You could, you know, um, say, hey, if debug, you know, for i in range 10, I could just have it do something like print i, right? And if debug is off, nothing will happen. But if debugging is on, now it's going to do that action. And another thing that we can do is instead, maybe like this, these statements that you want output are not actually, you don't want this to actually be written to whatever program or uh, um, file that you're, you're, you, you're redirecting this output to. You can output this information as system error. And what this does is this output still to your screen, but it's a different channel. So it actually won't be written to the same place where your print statements are being written. So this can be helpful if you wanted to, to give you out some information to report information back to you, but not actually have it become part of the output that you're generating. So in this case, you use that sys module to access the system, uh, the standard error output, and you'll write a statement to the standard error. And if I do that, notice here it tells me debugging is on, right? And this isn't part of the normal script, it's just, it's at a later point. So um, this, you can see how useful this type of approach can be if you wanted to add in some statements to help report back some information. So what about the time module and using the try accept statements? Well, let's take an example where we use these swissprod.txt files. Um, and these files, uh, if we look at them, what we see is that they're just some pieces of information that come from the SwissProd Uniprod database that describes some proteins that we might find in that database. And if we look at this file and then we look at the next file, we basically see that you know some of these entities were already in SwissProd 1, but we added in a few other extra things. So if we take a, a segment of code where we take these files, we add the if um, we'll extract the accession number, which is the first field, and we'll add in some information um, associated with that key to a dictionary. And if the dictionary, the entry already exists, what we'll basically do is we'll, we'll add it to the existing entry, but if it doesn't exist, we'll create a new entry to that dictionary. So we'll do that for the shorter file in SwissProt uh, SwissProt1, and basically we're only going to be creating new entries, right? Because initially this dictionary is going to be empty. Um, but we'll take and see how, how long it takes to do that. Then we'll go ahead and we will run the second loop 
and we'll use another if else statement to add in the information from SwissBar2, which is the longer file. If we go ahead and do this, uh, we can see that the we get a time for loop one and loop two, right? And this is about how much time it takes from the start of the loop till the end of the loop, right? We take start time and we use the time dot time command from the time function from the time module. And we set that equal to start time before the loop. And then we take that time again and subtract the start time from it to get the actual value of how long it took to run that loop. If we then do the same thing for the same bit of code, but the only thing we change here is we change it so that uh, we do a try and accept uh, statement in this, in this place instead of an if else statement. Uh, when we run that code, we'll notice that we actually run it faster then we ran about twice as fast than what we ran up here, right? So it took a lot, so it took about half the amount of time to the same uh, type of code, but using this try accept statement structure rather than the if else one. Um, so it just goes to show you how it can be faster. And I can do other things too, like I can set up a debug uh, value where I can allow it to report some information if we are debugging. Right. And so in this case, again, this try is saying, hey, you're going to try to add something to the dictionary. But if it doesn't exist, if there's no key there, then it's going to create a new entry to that dictionary. And if we run this now, um, notice it puts out a whole bunch of information and now it takes longer. Right. Because it's got to print out these statements. So it's going to take longer to run this code. Now it's about the same amount of time as what we have up here. But of course, we're doing more at this case. It does go to show you that debugging can slow down your programs a little bit. Um, so uh, anyway, this was just a, a few examples on how to debug your code. I hope they'll be helpful for you as you move forward.